Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Social Mobility Commission's Employers Masterclass, Let's Talk About Class. Um, I'm Paula Kemp, I'm Head of um, Employer Engagement here at the Social Mobility Commission, and um, just want to give a little bit of housekeeping before we get started and introduce our uh, two guests who have agreed to talk about class with us um, on the topic today. So um, if all the participants could remain on mute, that would be great. Uh, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions you've got. We'll come to those at the end. Uh, the webinar, as you've heard, will be recorded. Um, and if you do want to play closed captions um, to uh, see the, the transcript, um, you can look at the bottom uh, of your screen and there should be on your uh, task uh, bar, should be able to enable those. They have been enabled for you to work. So if you do need those, please do do that. Um, so today um, I'm going to uh, obviously start things off and, talk, uh, and then introduce our speakers. Um, and our speakers are then going to have a conversation with me and, and each other uh, in terms of what they've done about kind of talking about class and raising the issue of talking about class within the workplace. Um, and we'll also then come to you for any questions. So please do uh, use that Q&A function to do that. Um, and then at the end, we'll um, give you some next steps in terms of what resources and support is out there for you to bring this into your own workplace. Um, so if I could just start by by um, uh, telling you that the, this follows on from a series of workshops we've done and, and masterclasses we've done recently where we've discussed accents in the workplace and also the art of using storytelling to build in inclusion. Um, and it's really important that conversations are had within the workplace um, just to drive that um, that piece around inclusion and for people to feel like they belong. Um, so we've got uh, two great speakers to join us today. So I'm going to uh, introduce them and then I'm going to ask them to give you a bit of a, um, a, 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 a background to, to their story, really. Um, and I have asked them uh, to share what they feel comfortable sharing, uh, which is obviously uh, something you need to do when you are asking people to share information, personal information within the workplace. So we've got Sophie Hulme, who is the CEO of Progress Together. Uh, she was head of skills uh, policy at the City of London, and she was the founder and architect of a government commission socioeconomic diversity task force. Um, and she sees a clear link between skills and labour challenges which exist in, in the UK financial services and the need for greater socioeconomic diversity at senior levels. Um, and she joined Progress Together, a membership organisation, um, as the chief executive in September 2022. Um, Progress Together is a not-for-profit membership body that launched in May 2022 to create equity of progression for individuals in the financial service sector. So I'm sure um, we'll ha have some great insight from Sophie in terms of her work at the task force, as well as her work with those membership organisations in uh, in pro who are members of uh, Progress Together, we're also been joined by Jenny Sandra, who is the as a senior civil servant in the Ministry of Defence and their social mobility champion. Uh, Jenny's progressed from an administrative assistant within the civil service to a senior civil servant working across a range of departments. Uh, she left school at 16, I'm sure she'll share a bit more about this, and got her first degree 10 years into her, her career. Um, she's an advocate for social mobility and ensuring that opportunities are open for all, regardless of an individual's background. So welcome to both of our speakers. Um, so if I'm gonna to come to you first, I wonder, would you uh, share a little bit about your background? Sure, happy to, and thank you for, for inviting me today, Paula. So my dad is a working class East Londoner. My mum uh, is a retired university lecturer with, with immigrant parents. Um, and when I was small, my dad was a security guard. Um, I was raised in Brighton, moved to London, uh, and we lived with lodgers until I was 14. Um, my dad eventually became all manner of things to do with the sea. Uh, so worked at sea, became a lock keeper and, and such like. I went to a state school, um, a pretty bog standard one, uh, but in a relatively nice area. Um, I went to further education college and an ex poly uh, where I went and studied for a marketing degree. Uh, and going to an ex poly has always been a bit of a sore point for me because when I went for an interview in my 20s, 
the interviewer had, um, she had also gone to university in Bristol and I had gone to an ex-poly in Bristol. And she said to me at the time, oh, you went to the University of Bristol too, because I'd mentioned going to university in Bristol. And at that point, I felt such a kind of level of shame that I didn't admit to her that I'd gone to an ex-poly in Bristol. Um, and I kept just going with the conversation and I didn't say anything at all. Um, now, a couple of years later in that same organisation, a chance encounter with the chairman of that organisation, I found out that, and he was talking to some students at a local school, I found out that he too had gone to an ex-polytechnic. And I thought, crikey, if you can have gone to achieve the same in my in terms of education that I've achieved, and he's become the chairman of, organ of an organisation, that was my light bulb moment. And I thought, actually, it doesn't matter what's been before. It doesn't matter that my dad didn't know any bankers or lawyers or anyone that worked in the city. The closest he'd been to the city had been selling newspapers in Liverpool Street Station when he was 15. Um, and it was that light bulb moment that really kind of shifted where I thought I could move in life. Brilliant. That's great. Thanks, Sophie. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's the the sort of there is a hierarchy almost that's been built within organisations that uh, in terms of the standard of education in in those institutes or the, or the type of people that go there. And and obviously, you know, there, there's lots of work within all of the universities in terms of widening participation. Um, and you know some of the the quality of some of the degrees in in what might be considered ex polys or modern universities or whatever the framing of it is now. Um, and it, it's quite interesting in in terms of what some employers are doing across that. Uh, you know, not just looking to Russell Group universities and realizing there is talent. There are talented individuals and very academically gifted individuals across the whole spectrum. So thank you very much. So Jenny, let's come to you. Okay, so let me, in my very northern accent, um, you can't you can't mistake it, unfortunately, um, tell you a little bit about my background. I'll, and you're right, it's bits that people want to share. We all have things, some of it's baggage, some of it's things that have given us resilience and grit. But it's really important that when people do talk, they share the bits they're interested in. So if people are asking questions, open questions are very useful. So you don't pry down a rabbit warren where someone doesn't want you to go. So I left home and school at 16. I went to school in Blackpool. I don't know if anyone's seen Blackpool in the press, but in terms of life chances, when you're going to die, how much ill health you'll have, Blackpool's right down there in the bottom of league tables. So going to school there, um, and getting a job after school when I left at 16. It, the only place was seasonal work in Blackpool. Um, when the elimination stopped, work stopped. So I cleaned bedrooms at 16. I was very good at it, I still am. Um, but I joined the civil service at the bottom just to get red, regular wage. That link of regular wage is a, a motivator that has persisted throughout my career. I won't, I won't talk about it anymore now. But my dad sold fish out the back of a fish van. He was a fishmonger, you had to get a peddler's license. Um, he had no qualifications. My mother's family were travellers. Um, a lot of them didn't have formal work. They had no qualifications. So for me to leave school with GCSEs was quite remarkable. And the first person to even do that in my family. So that's the sort of benchmark against which I measured my success. And it felt to me like success framed against other people. Um, it probably wasn't because I had no A-levels and my first degree with the OP University, I couldn't afford the extra year to get the honours bit. So I have a non-honours degree. But I got 300 points. I funded it myself and I could tick the box to progress up the ladder. So um, in terms of um, some of those um, markers um, that they use to test how socially, economically diverse the workforce are, uh, my dad was unemployed at 14, so um, I can tick the box for what your parental income and occupation was at 14. Um, my postcode, the postcode is very much one of those that you can tick a box and say, I identify with that. But I don't like it to be a tick box. I think we all come with opportunities, backgrounds, bits that were harder, bits that were easier, but also determination and grit. So I'm delighted you're talking about class today because for me, it's one of the things that demarks me from others in defence and yet has probably given me um, a different perspective that, that nowadays because it's more normal to talk about it is very much um, valued yeah definitely and I think a, a good grounding your background gives you a good grounding for the workplace as well so uh, we've heard people in the past talk about their background being their superpower in an organization that might not have so many or not be so representative it it, it 
it's their difference, but it's also their superpower. So it's great to hear uh, you talk about grit and resilience, etc. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, Sophie, um, I know you've been involved at the very heart of understanding the experience of those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, starting through your work at the City of London that we've mentioned a bit through to the formation of the Financial and Professional Services Task Force, and now your work with financial service providers um, at uh, Progress Together. If you think back to when you first started talking about class in the workplace, what were the sort of steps that you took to engage your stakeholders? So for me, I came at this from a, as a policy professional. So I was head of skills policy and I was set the task to think, you know, how do we um, maintain global competitiveness in terms of UK financial and professional services? And one of the challenges for that sector is, is the lack of skills. And so that's when I started thinking about, OK, let's we need to look at the diversity, equity and inclusion space gender this was at the time of 2017 um gender was being talked about a lot ethnicity was certainly kind of um being talked about more and more certainly with black lives matter um and there was there wasn't very much being talked about in terms of social mobility at, at the time um and then we seed funded the social mobility employer index this is when i was at the city of london corporation um and um, because I happen to work for the City of London, I thought, well, what's our USP? And our USP is that of a convener. We can get people in, in the room. Um, and so there was an opportunity to think very big here in terms of how can we bring people together and resolve a, a, the challenge around access to skills, um, but also into looking at social mobility. Um, so I knew that I wanted to develop some sort of task force, some sort of big group that would push for change. But what I needed was the evidence. And that's when I started working with Nick Miller and the Bridge Group to look at what's the evidence say in terms of financial services specifically. Um, and that piece of work was, was critical really. So we found out through there that 89% of senior leaders in financial services come from professional backgrounds, but it's only 47% at junior levels. So what was happening is financial services firms are investing a huge amount of, of effort and resource diversifying the graduate intake, working with schools, but not working up through the pipeline. Um, and that same bit of evidence, we found that there was a 25% progression gap for employees from working class backgrounds. So they progressed 25% slower than their peers, and there was zero link to job performance. And then worryingly, we surveyed 8,000 for um, employee, employees and interviewed over 100. Employees from working class backgrounds were saying that they were wasting energy conforming to dominant cultures. And that was impacting their job performance and productivity. And so that got us thinking, well, if it's impacting individuals in terms of their own productivity, the mental toll of trying to be something that you're not, what's that doing for the sector? And what's it doing for, for organisations as well? So the evidence was critical in terms of engaging stakeholders. Once we had that, we were then were easily able to engage governments. So HM Treasury and Bayes were, were very keen to, to commission the task force because they realised that there was a huge productivity link here. Um, I think Sophie might have frozen. So, okay. so we'll continue, and we'll. Oh, Sophie, I think you froze for a second. Am I back? You are back. Yes. Great. Um, so, getting government um, government backing was critical, but also having the regulators involved on the task force as observers is really key. Um, now, when we launched the task force, there were 30 spaces for task force members and we got over 80 applicants. And these are all senior leaders that had personal experience of socioeconomic um, or, or of social mobility. Um, they were all personally passionate. But once we got those influencers, the ones that can really push change within their own organisations and across the sector, joining forces with the regulators, government, um, then things really, really flew. But evidence is key. And then getting the influencers. Brilliant. And it's having those conversations with the influencers and finding those people who do want to be those advocates. That's really uh, driven it. So that's great to hear. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so, Jenny, I, I mean, talking a bit about those influencers, actually, we know how important it is to get leadership buy-in to drive the conversation um, for your work within the Ministry of Defence. And also, I know that you do a lot of work across uh, in your role as social mobility champion across um, the civil service to support a cultural shift. 
how do you how do you do that um and and what works what do you feel works let's talk about how we change culture um i actually got a text from my boss about this before because my role is changing um very shortly and culture is very much what you say and do it's what you praise what you reward and what you walk past and ignore so for me in terms of culture change what i say and do those who know me on linkedin or those who know me in the workplace every week more than once a week I try to ensure there are conversations about social mobility, all sorts of aspects of it. It can be progression, it can be outreach, it can be mentoring and coaching. It can be our better data that we're trying to get to measure it. Um, it can be my personal story sometimes, although once you've heard it once, you don't want to hear it again. Humour, by the way, is one of the things that can connect you. And I find that uh, people like listening to my stories because I sometimes have some rather unusual ones where I drop things in that, um, that are another story for another day. But it's all about culture change. So for me, um, when I've had my game of hurdling, um, going up the ladder of the, um, the civil service, I call it a game of hurdling because every single time I've wanted to go up seven or eight levels now, there's been barriers in the way. Every single time, different barriers, whether it's someone telling me that I need to sort my hair out, get a gray suit, improve my accent, I mean, how do you improve your accent? How can I, how can I talk like I talk and then suddenly ins insert the word bath in the middle of it? You know, it just sounds so ridiculous. And yet people tell you these things are impediments that I need to get over. Um, but I, I've got this determination and grit. I mentioned it before. I'm aware that when someone says no or someone tells me something that's someone's view, one person's view in a huge workforce of 225,000 at the moment in defence and over 500,000 in the whole civil service if we separate out the civil servants. So one view is just a view and I respect people for their view and I respect other people for different views. So for me, this game of hurdling has, has been a chance to see barriers that I've experienced and got over and then look back behind me and say, I don't want other people to play hurdling like I have. So influencing policy, telling people, you made this harder for me because when I applied for the fast stream, which is a graduate programme, the very first year that you didn't need a degree, it took six years with the Open University, doing it every night to get my degree, but no one would pay for my travel. There was no capacity to do that. So I got the overnight bus from Blackpool at 10.30 at night, arriving in Victoria at 6 a.m. to go for the fast stream assessment centre. I did it, but then I said, no one else should do that again. I also told the story of the vagrant that got on the bus and got ejected by police at Birmingham and all sorts of stories, stories bring it to life. So I think culture is what you talk about, what you do, what you shout out, what you raise awareness of. It's how you live your life every day. It's who you support, who you don't support, who you are ally with. And I have a very big um, social network, I guess it is. I'm not a party animal. I don't like going out, but I like people. And therefore I connect and listen and influence and learn. And it's all about people ultimately. That's how we do culture. Sorry, that's a long, long-winded answer. That's great. No, I, and, and it ties in nicely to the themes that we've been doing, talking about accents and how that shouldn't, impl you know, that, that nobody should uh, make assumptions based on your accents, but also the storytelling and the, the personal storytelling. So it's a nice sort of segue back to our past stuff, which is still available for people who, who want to see it. So thank you for that. And, and I think it's interesting. It's, you know, barriers, hurdles, but, you know, barriers do sound quite closed off and, and clearly hurdles, you can get over them, but some you, some you need lowered or taken away. Or And so I think that's a great description. Thank you. And it's a, it's a great sort of reminder that all leaders should be thinking about what challenges they faced or they know of challenges others face because they may not have had that challenge. And I think having that open conversation about uh, what are the challenges and barriers people face for those who don't see those barriers or haven't experienced them, it's a it's a real eye opener. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Sophie, I know through Progress Together, you are engaging CEOs um, and senior leaders in financial services. And, and some of them have only started to think about socioeconomic background um, as part of their d &I agenda, you know, only more recently. And, and, and certainly I think the task force obviously helped kind of elevate that conversation and elevate the, the need for change. Um, what are they saying about the subject and what are they saying about why they want to get involved in progress together? 
So yes, we've got over 30 members now, so and they represent 30% of the UK financial services workforce. So we've got some of the, the bigger firms um, within the sector as within our membership. Um, now to join Progress Together, there are a number of commitments. So employers have to start collecting data on workforce socioeconomic background for a start. And then in year two, you have to all of them, all of the members have to share line by line anonymous employee data so that we can track progression gaps, so we can uh, figure out where our members join us and where they end up and track impact. But critically also, there needs to be an EXCO sponsor aligned to, to progress together and to be an active member and part of progress together. And so that involves meeting with me and our chair, Vincent Keaveney, once a year, but also meeting as a group of EXCO sponsors and CEOs. Now, in September, having collected all of the data from our, from our members, we're going to analyse that and create benchmark, and then we're going to produce that and, and feed it back to the, the CEOs uh, in September. Now, some of them, when I meet with them, they want to engage in this because they are personally passionate. They've got lived experience of it and that's their driver. Others are driven by the business benefits. So some will know that in financial services, we've got the, the most vacancies than we have ever had in the quarter, quarter one of this year. So there's a real skills challenge here, um, but we have good talent within our organizations as I demonstrated from the, the stat before. Um, so some are driven by skills, some are driven by what their investors are saying. So an asset management firm said to me the other day, they'd seen a fourfold increase in inquiries from investors on socioeconomic diversity in the last 12 months. So there's, there are demands coming from all over the place and then also regulators. So we know the Solicitor's Regulation Authority already asked for data. Financial services regulators had a discussion paper out talking about socioeconomic background as well as other DNI strands. There's a consultation due out this year, um, towards the back end of, of this year. I've no doubt the socioeconomic background will, will feature in there too. And members are beginning to think, well, we need to get ahead of the curve. If the regulators are going to start asking us to, to collect this data, we want to start now. And that's really why many of them join Progress together, because we can help them with that. Um, but then also there's the competitive spirit, right? These are financial services firms, very competitive, naturally. Um, and then you've got the likes of Santander, for example, uh, who Paul Rana, you know very well, um, who have a target for senior leadership. Um, so 35% of senior leaders to be from working class backgrounds by 2030. So when you're seeing your competitors come out and putting in their annual report that this is, you know, putting a flagpole in the sand and saying this is where we want to get to, then that drives engagement. So whether it's from a personal passion experience or whether it's the business case, um, there are a number of different, different drivers. The challenges that we hear time and time again from leaders are how do we get the data? Once we've got the data, what do we do with it? Um, and then we want to learn from others so we avoid reinventing the wheel. Brilliant. That's great. And it's great to hear that there, you know, there are multiple reasons, uh, I think. So when I first started looking at DNI many years ago, uh, someone once said to me, how do we know that firms are committed? And I, and I think part of it is that they join membership organisations like yours and are willing to share information. So they, they see that it's a competitive advantage, but they don't keep it hidden from other people in terms of what they're doing. So it's great to hear that they're doing so much there. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot, and, and Sophie, I'll come back to you on this actually. So there's a lot talked about how socioeconomic background might impact those early in their careers when joining an organisation. Um, and Jenny, you obviously had said that as well. Um, but I know Sophie and I have talked about this many a time, um, that what, what other things we might want to consider across the whole life cycle. So there are a lot of, uh, we have a, a number of people who are on the call who are probably doing quite a lot of work in early years and early talent. Um, but um, especially as we consider progression through the organisation. Um, so, so how might people start want to talk about class within the progression space? It's a question to me or to Sophie, sorry. Uh, it's a question to Sophie, apologies. Yeah, I thought it was. I just... So, so you're absolutely right. You know, the, the focus on progression is, is much needed. As I mentioned, you know, that, that evidence I said at the beginning, 89% of senior leaders from professional backgrounds only 47% of junior talent from professional backgrounds. So there's lots being done on access and that's absolutely needed. But what we also need to make sure is that the individuals that come in from diverse backgrounds don't come in and then feel they don't belong and leave. It's a complete waste of everyone's time and effort and resources and not to mention the impact it has on the individual. So there must be a focus on progression. 
And so it's important that we look at what are the barriers for progression within, within an organisation. Um, I mean, financial services, there's um, often a sense of performance being linked to perceived kind of gravita, gravitas um, or external displays of, of confidence and, and you know, polish accents plays, plays a huge part of this. Um, but also opaque processes around promotion, work allocation, who gets the juicy projects? Is it those that shout the loudest, that, um, that, that are visible within the organisation that gets those, those projects, or are they fairly allocated? Um, and then also thinking about senior sponsors. So we know that uh, employees from working class backgrounds are 17% less likely to have access to a senior sponsor. So it's human nature for us as individuals to support people that remind us of ourselves when we were younger. Um, and that's how we are in, within our comfort zone. That's normal. How do we develop transparent processes that override that natural human instinct to, to do that? Um, and then in terms of other barriers, there's the, the, the net networks as well. So if you, like me, haven't got parents that have ever worked in financial or professional services, there are a million and one different unwritten codes that you just have no idea about. And you don't have the networks from that have gone to the same university or indeed friends of the family that just doesn't exist. So how do we um, support employees from working class backgrounds to, to overcome those? And then another challenge is around lack of data. So within financial services, we know that 23% of signatories to the Women in Finance Charter collect socioeconomic background data. It's only 23%. Now it has grown. Um, from previous years, but it's still a really small amount. There's lots of focus on collecting gender and ethnicity data and less around socioeconomic background data. And until you have that, you don't know what your problems are. You don't know where the challenges lie. You can't diagnose. Are there patterns of bias in particular regions, occupations, subsectors? So that the, the data is key here. Brilliant. Thank you. And I think that's really interesting in terms of that a lot of people are starting to do some work here, but but we found that when we uh, hosted our employer consultation in terms of people aren't being able to measure the impact because they've not, uh, not you know, not yet got involved with the, the data collection piece. Um, and it's great that there's so much work happening to support, but are you supporting in the right way? And who are you supporting? And which, as you say, which part of the business do you need to support? Um, so that's great to hear that. Thank you. Um, Jenny, I think there's a, a, a piece around uh, what role allies play here. So um, Sophie mentioned that some of the senior leaders, you know, that they've got uh, they've got the lived experience and they that's why they're, they're passionate about the story. Um, but obviously you don't have to come from a working class background or a low socioeconomic background to kind of get involved in this. So what role do you see the allies play? I think it's part of being a community, it's part of being society, and I think it's really hard to have demarcation between um, the classes. Are you definitely lower socioeconomic or not? You might have had one attribute and not another, and I find that belonging to a solidarity movement is a bit hard um, in my experience, and therefore the people who are part of my network across defence, I don't know what background they come from. Um, I don't ask, I don't care, to be honest. I want them to understand we all have different lived experiences and to contribute to make the workplace more fair in the future. So I suspect that half of my network may well um, tick boxes and half may not. And yet all of them are rolling up their sleeves to focus on things that can make the workplace um, more fair in the future. So mentoring and coaching is really, really important. I don't want nepotism just because you've got a friend in high places, you get on better than someone else. Um, but in terms of having a sounding board, someone to listen to, someone to give you the confidence. There was a person on LinkedIn sent me a message yesterday. I mentored him. He found me on a list some years ago. And he wrote, because I'd shared something to say, because I gave him a kick um, in the right direction, to stop wallowing in how unhappy he was in his job. He'd had the confidence to go and apply for another job and subsequently had three progressions. So he had gone from being um, in the sort of bottom 20% of salaries uh, up the ladder three times, purely because I believed in him and he therefore believed in himself. 
and I was there wanting to know, so what, what form did you put in? When's the interview? How have you prepped? Have you looked online at their company accounts? So there's something about allies in um, supporting, listening, and not, there's a bit of tell. And this is where the asking direct rather than open questions is important. Sometimes you have to say, so where, where do you see your future? Nice, direct, close question. So you can help the person map their way there but you don't ask direct um, questions around how rubbish was your education or something like that that's, that's terribly um, emotive. So I think choosing when you ask the direct questions about the future um, and about maybe wh where do you think your skills lie? Where, where's your competence? Where is your dream job? Those nice closed questions are wonderful to help them um, go through that thinking process themselves. Um, but equally, I like to look forward and not look back. I could moan about how awful things were in 1984 or something like that, but uh, I'm not George Orwell and life will get better if I own it and I ask for support. So the final point I talked about mentoring and coaching, it's social capital. It's build your learning from others. LinkedIn's wonderful. If you want to go and work in the Department for Business and Trade, I was a guest speaker there last week. I don't know anything about them, but you can connect on LinkedIn. You can read their annual reports and accounts. You can see what they post. So um, I think it is grow your connections, learn from others. There is no one right way. If you think you know the answer, find other answers, broaden your horizons. And um, from that, you will have continuous improvement. And as life is all about a change curve and it never stays static, you should never assume you're good enough because it will change so fast. You have to keep you have to keep running to keep up with the race of life. Brilliant. Thank you. And I think there's there's a piece there in terms of from a allyship perspective and a, and a mentor and a sponsorship if you've been sponsored or mentored yourself you know please do also pay it forward I think there's uh you know quite often that in all organizations they talk about running some of these programs um and yet they struggle to find mentors occasionally so you know you can be a you can be mentored as well as being a mentor for someone else so you know please really consider that and I think it's a great way to think about allyship as well it's uh, you know, it, it's not just about being an advocate um, within your organisation, also actually, you know, getting down at grass levels and getting your hands dirty for want, want of a better phrase, really. Do something. D don't just talk about it. Do something. Do something as well. Yeah. So not just let's talk about class, let's do class, that kind of thing. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to come to both of you. So I think, um, Sophie, first, uh, one of the things we often hear from employees and employers is the feeling that class, although you mentioned it a bit, uh, Jenny, earlier, is incredibly emotive subject. Um, there are issues around what terminology to use. Um, how can employers address this and sort of create that safe space for employees to share their experience? So I'll come to you first, Sophie, and then I'll come to you, Jenny. Sure. So I think we've touched on this before, but role modelling is, is really key. So getting the senior leaders, the middle management that come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, have a different range of accents to be talking about their journey. I think that is that is key. Um, but then also there's a there's a real need to build trust around the data piece. So why are we as employers collecting the data? It's not to make individual promotion decisions. It's to, pop, it's to spot patterns of, of bias so that we can change the organisation and then the culture as a whole. It's much more big picture. So there's a lot of work to be done on, on the building trust piece. Um, and also white men historically have felt excluded from the DEI conversation. But here's an opportunity to, to engage that, that group in a discussion here. Um, at the task force, we did a, um, a piece of work looking at intersectionality, and we saw, and apologies, I'm going to read out some stats, but we saw that 45% of white, 45% of senior leaders were white men from professional backgrounds. Only 13% of senior leaders were white men from working class backgrounds. So you can see the impact that being working class has on your ability to get to the top. And the same is true of, of women and people from um, ethnic minority backgrounds. So for example, 23% uh, senior leaders are white women from professional backgrounds, but only 9% white women from working class backgrounds. Um, and then looking at ethnic minority males, so 5% of senior leaders, ethnic minority males from uh, professional backgrounds, but only 2%, same again from working class backgrounds. Um, so there's an opportunity to talk about the intersectionality piece, which can kind of open up the conversation to a broader range of people. 
Um, but also have an employee voice uh, is important here. So organizations that have networks, often they will have a social mobility network or an ethnicity network or a gender network. Um, and those that do it well, connect those networks together um, and they encourage the employee voice to feed into the DNI strategy. So it's not only, it's critical to have this, but it's not only a safe space for employees to talk to each other, but also whatever's said in there, anonymously or otherwise, feeds into what the business actually does to make a change. And if you have the chairs of each of the committee employee resource groups talking to each other and feeding into the development strategy, it's how you can have a safe space, but also make sure that things change within an organisation. And it's been talked about more and more. I mean, only today, um, Sir Keir Starmer was talking about smashing the class ceiling. Yeah, this The more we normalise this and have it in everyday conversation, whether that's in politics, in business, then, then the more it will feel like this is this is achievable and we can make a change. Brilliant. Thank you. Jenny? Can I just talk about equality impact assessments, which is a little bit about voice of networks, but more formal. We have a legal duty with protected characteristics when we're doing any sort of change that might impact customers or our staff to do an equality impact assessment. We don't legally have to consider it from a class perspective. And yet, why wouldn't you? Um, if you want to think about, um, will this policy work for people in regional, people who um, are in lower grades and plan to stay there, whatever that is. So I think improving the way that you deliver change through using tools, existing tools, and getting the voice of your people is really, really important. Um, but just to think about it, if I was leading my team, I do lead my team. Um, I really do. Um, one of the things I like to do, rather than ask them to talk about their background um, per se, I like to do some of these personality types to see if they're uh, this type or that type or a yellow hat or a blue hat. Sometimes you can use proxies to find out who they are and what they bring to the workplace. It's what they bring, not what they don't bring, um, using these, these tools. So I think that's the second thing. So quality impact assessment, personality types. And the third one is consultation, but in a third person. So if you were wanting to say to a person, how will we be more inclusive for people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, for people who grew up in um, rural areas? <clears throat> you can ask these questions. They may have grown up there and uh, associate with that, but you can't beat that consultation. So rather than make it personal, they can make it personal themselves in response, but depersonalizing it is kinder. I, Think you have to treat everyone's background and upbringing with kindness and i really hate really hate prying questions the moment i get a narrow prying question that shuts me up i'll share what i choose not what they want to tell me so. brilliant thank you and, and i notice in our q a and it sort of ties in nicely in terms of what we talked about a bit a bit about the sort of emotive subject is someone's actually said i struggled to identify with working class because although our experiences were of a low socioeconomic flavor we were in brackets, traumatised incomers to a local working class. Um, it's better for me to talk about socioeconomic experience. So, you know, when, when people are having these conversations in the workplace, how should they be framing them? So, Sophie, I'll come to you first. Sorry, say that again, Paula, I just missed you. Oh, so they they said for them, they don't, they, they don't, uh it's triggering to use the word working class for them um so they prefer to talk about lower socioeconomic background or socioeconomic yeah. background have you heard any of this in the discussions you've had with um leaders as well as workforce yeah it's a really interesting question because i remember i was at an event once and someone um the panel were talking about lower socioeconomic background and someone in the audience said lower as derogatory uh, i'm not lower you know, I am working class. And he felt very strongly about that. You know, there shouldn't be a higher and a, and a lower. But frankly, you will have different people thinking different things. And I think you'll tie yourself up in nuts thinking what's the best way of, of, of doing it. Um, each organisation will have a, have an approach that will work for their employees. And if you don't know the best, what you want your employees to call it, ask them, put it in the survey, find out what that, what works for them. Yeah, I mean, that's what I always say to people, ask people what you want to, want to be referred to as. Yeah, definitely. So, Jenny, do you have any extra comments on that at all? Um, yes, I was actually asked the, the question to how do you talk about people who've had um, difficult upbringings? I said, don't, don't call it that. <laughs> so I, I think that's it's really important that language 
that there is no right there is no right phrase and even imposter syndrome which is something that 70 percent of my network experience i get pushed back on that saying it's imposter phenomenon it's not imposter syndrome we'll never get you right uh, caveat things saying i call it this you might call it that can i also say that because of being from a, a non-working um, class up, upbringing well you know my dad didn't work when I was 14 um, but I don't like the, the word ladies I find ladies an elitist thing and for me it's <laughs> the toilets so even things like ladies and gentlemen you know I'm a woman and um, it's very much part of being working class so you can get it wrong with me as well so um, yeah I, I bristle slightly at that because I'm, I wasn't born a lady so <laughs> you know just accept accept you do it with best intent you don't do it to goad you'll never get it right for 100 percent. and caveat it with i know some of you choose to call it this that um whatever but my word for me is this yeah that's that's really great advice actually you saying that about the ladies i, I had a colleague who didn't know we were doing a women in a, a women business leaders program but someone said they thought women in business sounded very 1980s um and I and then we were having this discussion and actually all the women business leaders were saying just call us business leaders which was obviously yeah that makes total sense but also a few people saying I don't like females don't say females because it sounds like the, the toilet so yeah I mean I I so totally empathize with you on that um I think we know so um Sophie had mentioned the bridge group before so um, they had done some research that showed that uh, it is an emotive subject, but it's no more emotive than asking someone about their religion or their sexuality. But because of the Equality Act and because they've been doing it for a long time, people are more used to talking about or, or um, um, disclosing or, or sharing their sexuality or their religion in terms of if you are collecting data. So it's one of those things that it feels like it's more emotive. And I think there's also a piece around, um, you know, if you are a uh, an older person in the workforce, you've got their, that into your position by your own merits in terms of uh, your achievements. And so it shouldn't be relevant what your parents did, uh, but what, you know, it is the best proxy for social mobility. So that is the question to ask. So um, thank you both for that. Um, I've got, um, I think we've covered, is there anything people should avoid talking about? Because we've talked about not saying disadvantage, etc. So I think we'll skip that question. I know, um, Sophie, uh, you said members have recently taken an audit. Um, are there any key findings about organisations openly talking about class? In, in their workplace that would be useful for the people on the call to hear? We, uh, some of our members, so I mentioned we've got over 30 members now, 100% of them collect data on socioeconomic background and they all, so thanks to the Social Mobility Commission, collect data on parental occupation at 14, which is brilliant. Um, and, and I think that's that's really important that that, that shift is, is, is coming through. But also critically, it's now 65% are um, tracking that data through their HR systems, which is really important because then you can track rates of progression. Um, now, obviously, if, if you've only got your kind of once a year staff survey, then that's fantastic. You've still got the data. But if you embed it into the HR systems, that, that, that's even better. Um, and in terms of the response rate, so across our membership, it's roughly 50% 50, 50 response rate from employees. Now, Obviously, that's not 100%. It's not as um, high as, as most firms have on gender and ethnicity, but it's getting there. Um, and I think that, that that's really key. You know, it's, it's positive that it's increasing year on year. Now, there's lots of focus on role modelling, which is really key in terms of what are the interventions that our members are doing. Um, and, and lots of uh, advertising promotion opportunities and the criteria for, for promotions are being advertised. Um, so that that's public, which is which is great, or at least open transparent um there's less on targets i would say into the coming through from our from our audit so not very many firms yet are, are using that data to say okay where do we want to get to and then holding themselves uh, account to that and, and that's something that we're working hard with our members to to do more of that um and when i say targets i don't mean quotas i mean just having a business target like you would whether it's for climate or for profit you know where do you want to end up um because unless you know where you want to end up you're going to take a long time to get anywhere. Um, and then there's less on transparent processes around work allocation. 
Um, and, and that's something that we're really keen to see our members do, do more of. And certainly it's worked across uh, professional services. So KPMG recently uh, produced a report on what, what has impact and uh, the fact that social uh, socioeconomic background has a big impact on progression, basic progression. Work allocation came up in their report. So we know what works across different sectors, and we're now working with members to ensure that they're focusing on, on those bits as well and getting the data so that they can then track what works within their own organisations. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Jenny, I'm going to ask you um, a, a one last question, and then there's a few in the, in the Q&A that I think will be really interesting to discuss. So um, the SMC is encouraging organisations to consider the importance of regional variations. Um, and uh, when you are talking about class within regions, does the conversation change much or should it change much? Yes. So I think I think there are two regional factors that are worth noting. The nations of Scotland and Wales have national agendas and they have national opportunities. And I don't like to talk about social mobility um, with a London centric angle to it when I am regional. I, I often do talk in the region, so it's really important. Northern Ireland as well um, brings with it um, another set of challenges being part of another country and being part of ours as well. It's very, very, very interesting. So I think recognise national identity. Um, otherwise, you'll just lose them before you begin. And then recognise what the landscape in those regions is like. And when I think of the Navigating the Labyrinth report, which some people may have read, it talked about public um, service and the opportunities. People like me, who are regional, are more likely to go into operational delivery roles rather than policy, because policy roles are in town, which is using some phrase which you learn when you work with people in London. It's funny, isn't it? They have this language that is London centric. They also go for supper, which isn't cheese on toast at 10.30 at night. It's, it's food at about six o'clock, I've learned. So regionally, language is slightly different. Opportunities are different. Um, the interesting thing about operational delivery is that you will go up the career pathway slower. You just will. The opportunities are there, but they are they are fewer. Um, and that's the thing about regional um, regional conversations. The interesting thing, however, is that when you come from a lower socioeconomic background, you feel part of community. Community is such a strong driver. Everyone rolls up their sleeves and helps everyone out borrowing the cups of sugar from your neighbour, all of those uh, archetypal things that, that you do when you grow up. And therefore that meritocracy of working in a large operational delivery uh, organisation, you fit in better. So it, it might be slower up the career ladder, but um, people will naturally gravitate to it. And if you look at the data, the, the blend of lower, lower, medium, higher socioeconomic background, a lot more people are attracted to that type of work. So it is interesting, but yeah, it has to be different conversations. Do not talk about town um, in the Northeast. They won't, it won't be the same thing. They, they have, have their own towns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That, that's really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of research out there to say about operational roles and not delivering you to the C-suite. That's not the progression pathway. And it's how can organisations think about mapping talent across and how can individuals also think about progression you're not always going up you could do a sideways move um into you know in government it's probably more the policy that's what navigating the labyrinth the policy type roles uh they were always the the i think the terminology at the time was used was it was velvet drain pipe uh, into those kind of um, C-suite um, and senior roles. Uh, but how could you move out of operations into one thing or the other? And likewise, you know, people can obviously go to go the other way across. Uh, brilliant. I'm going to come back to you um, in a minute. I think uh, there's there's a great question in the chat, which I might have to read it a couple of times. Um, so it's would it would be interesting to hear where members of the panel and their organizations draw the line, and that is in quote marks. How do you decide to classify the class of people that you want to provide support to? I've seen various ways in questions used in surveys that are a proxy for class. So for instance, par parents go into university, um the job role of your parents etc is there an agreed best proxy or way to gather that and so we've obviously got some guidelines at the smc but interested to hear your thoughts of what else uh, people are talking about in your organization so jenny i'm going to come to you first 
Um, I think if I um, think of it purely from a military perspective, um, region is good enough. So we know um, the amount of people that we bring in and their level of qualification that they come in means that we run the largest apprenticeship um, scheme in the whole of the UK. So if you're looking for um, easy measures, um, roughly, if you're targeting Lancashire, you know what the um, affluence or otherwise of Lancashire is. So quick and dirty, um, I think, choose region and choose level of qualification when you leave school. Um, they work really well for the military. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. And, and actually, that ties in nicely. We've got a regional data tool that will be launching as part of our State of the Nation report in September. So people can use that tool to have a look at what regions are, uh, you know, the social mobility aspect of those regions. So um, thank you as well for a nice segue into that. Sophie, to you. So for us, our, our financial services members are often global organisations and they say to us, well, how are we going to collect data if I've got someone that was educated overseas or uh, how does that work? And, and so for us, parental occupation at 14 is the best metric to ask because if you're asking state versus public, it just doesn't make any sense in terms of education if you're educated overseas. Uh, if you talk about free school meals, again, there's a, a kind of an age cut off. Um, which again won't make sense for all employees so so for us and the sector that I work with it absolutely makes sense to focus on on, on that one and then as you know Paula there are kind of as I call them backup questions um, which some of our employers ask if they've got more space on their, their survey but they absolutely focus on that top one first. Yep definitely and it's an absolute proxy for class in terms of um it you know I, I say to people because obviously we all often get the the challenge around uh, usually it's nurses versus plumber. Yesterday it was teachers versus uh, electricians, I think. So, uh, but but it's the same. So one's considered professional class and one's considered working class. However, we know there are financial disparities amongst that. Uh, but I think you need to think about it's your socioeconomic background. So not only is it the income that your family had, it's also those cultural networks and that access to uh, education etc cetera, etc cetera. so um so thank you for that um just also I, paula just on, on that um because it's the question that's asked in the census our members find it really useful that they can then compare how they're doing against national benchmarks as well which they found really helpful brilliant that's great thank you um so i guess uh just as we we're sort of wrapping up and there's a few questions um we may have not got to so we will ask the panelists um to, to respond to those and if you've not asked them anonymously we will we will come back uh, you know we will let you know what they've said so i think um i just want to close with you you both sort of telling me really how important it is for employers to widen their conversations outside of the workplace and share it across industry and actually wider industries like you've both been very kind to do today because we've obviously got a real mix of people on the call so Jenny I'm going to come to you first if I think about UK and global Britain if we want to um, compete with the world to be the best at whatever we do we need to attract the broadest and widest workforce we can we won't innovate at the speed that others do unless unless we do that um, and to do that you just can't employ um, five percent of the population who look and sound the same so I think it, it gives us the competitive edge when we do it very well and if, if nothing else even if it's you don't think about the moral ground it's profit ground <laughs> that that I think is a really good motivator for for other sectors but we, we want to we want the best for our workforce and therefore um, attract the best that you can bring in brilliant thank you that's really lovely yeah to hear and uh, Sophie and from a, a talent perspective, at, at senior levels, or indeed the, the skills that we kind of uh, need the most, um, if we're all just poaching staff off each other, then that's not really going to help. Whereas if we're working collaboratively to try and upskill and bring people up through the pipeline so that we all, as a sector, have more talent to choose from, more kind of skilled uh, employees to drive that profitability and productivity that the businesses need, then that's win-win for, for everyone within the business space. Um, and the task force had a five-point pathway with recommendations. I know you're going to share later, Paula. But the final point is about publishing. So publishing the data, publish where, where you are and where how you progress, what works for you, like KPMG have, have done, which I mentioned, 
um, how you've done against targets, because that's how we will encourage others to take action on this. And it's only when whole sectors move together do we actually bring about the change that we need to be globally competitive. Brilliant. Yeah, I think there's something around at industry level, the conversations at UK, absolutely, like you say, Jenny, at UK level, the conversations need to happen. But industry level, that's when, you know, they there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, they, they do talk to each other or they hear what others are doing. And, and that's when they want to really kind of get in on the act for want of a better, of a better phrase, really. So um, just remains for me to say a big thank you to both of you for sharing um, everything that you do, but also for everything you do about class in the workplace. Uh, we will, as Sophie and Jenny have both alluded to, we will share resources that they've talked about and some of the, the reports that they've talked about as well with you, uh, everyone on the call. And this recording will be available for you to share with colleagues. Um, and also uh, one of my colleagues, Shannon, will kindly do a, a write up as well that you can share. Um, I'm just going to uh, fill you in on a few things that are coming up. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, so uh, we have uh, there's a, an event next week that um, is um, uh, being hosted by the Westminster wig and I can't remember what it's called, the Westminster Industry Group um, and it's on our website please, please do have a look at that um, um, but some of you may have seen that the co-op shared some research about their employee base that they'd undertaken and it's having that conversation so there's an online and an in-person event so please do visit our website um, and find out how you can join that on Monday. Uh, but our uh, de uh, director, uh, John Craven, will also be commenting on that. So please do join that. Um, and then we've also got a number of um, events that we will start um, sharing for the autumn. So uh, we've got our State of the Nation report that um, will uh, will publish uh, in September, um, and we'll be doing an event for uh, employers, charities, etc. To join us to hear a bit more about those findings and how we're going to take those findings, what we found further, what are we going to do in terms of our strategy. From an employer masterclass perspective, we are going to look at um, allyship. Uh, we're going to look at how how to measure the impact and also um, progression. Um, and we've also got our retail toolkit that's very soon to be published. And we'll be looking at doing some events around that um, in the second part of this year. Um, I, I'd just like to uh, really thank uh, both of our speakers again and, um, and really ask you for your feedback. So your feedback uh, for the past six months has really been driving the conversations we've had. Um, and, you know, in terms of the storytelling, that's what you wanted to hear. You wanted to hear how to, you know, what to do about accents, et cetera, and how to talk about class. We've obviously done um, sessions on data. So please do complete that feedback form when you receive it and let us know what sort of topics that you want to hear um, and where we can take this further. Um, so just remains to say, have a great summer. We'll be back in September. Um, and thank both Jenny and Sophie again for uh, joining us today. So, and of course, thank you for you to join us as well.